Okay, we're recording. Thank you, Athena. Um, seeing a presence of the quorum of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, I'm calling this special meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order on at 4.31 p.m. on June 2nd, 2022, pursuant to, the chap pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to make sure that our CRC members and our interview applicants, um, planning board applicants, can hear us and be heard. So I'm just going to go through everyone's name. Um, and when I say your name, just, just state that you're present and we'll be able to confirm everything. Um, Shalini. Present. Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Uh, Pam. Here. Jennifer. Present. And our applicants, Bruce. Present. And Karen. Oh, you have to unmute. Present. There we go. <laughs> so that is everyone. Um, people may be wondering, our interview list and our agenda had three names on it. Um, Bruce Coldham, John Gilbert, and Karn Winter. Um, I received an email at 2.45 this afternoon from John Gilbert withdrawing from the process. Um, and I have forwarded that email to all CRC members, but in short, he withdrew from the process because he was unable to reconcile um, conflicts he had on Wednesday nights and therefore would not be able to attend planning board interviews if we had made a recommendation to appoint him. And so he has withdrawn from the process and will not be attending the interviews today, which leaves us with two of the three people who are listed on the um, agenda. So I wanted to clear that up for anyone watching and wondering why we're moving forward without everyone who is listed on the agenda present. Um, so, um, with that, we are. I'm going to summarize how we're going to do this, um, and then we will start the interviews. Um, and so, how this works is you have Bruce and Karen, you have received the interview questions. They will actually be asked in the order they were listed on that document, um, but the questions will be asked by various members of the CRC. I will not be asking all of them. Um, and then we will alternate, since there are only two of you, we will alternate who goes first to answer those questions so it's not always the same person. Um, and you will have two to three minutes to answer. Um, I will be the one keeping time, um, which reminds me I have to set my clock to keep time. Um, but um, we will we will keep to, I will keep time um, and I will give you um, you know, I'll let you know when your time is up, basically, but you'll have somewhere between two and three minutes. My guess is at this point, given there are only two people, we're going to probably allow three minutes for every question because that just makes sense and that will give you enough time and we have plenty of time to do that. Um, are there any questions to either Bruce or Karen or any of the CRC members have questions before we begin asking the interview questions? I am not seeing any. So I will start the questioning off. Um, and so um, the, I start in alphabetical order. So Bruce, you will go first and then and then Karen, um, and then we'll switch for every other question. So now you can plan on which ones you're going first and second on. Um, but the first question is, what do you feel you bring to the planning board that can make it successful? Please include any experience you have appearing before or serving on the planning board or ZBA or watching one of their meetings. So Bruce. Okay, and um, Pat, I didn't include you among my friends because I didn't notice you up there on the screen and I was looking across at, uh, but anyway. Um, so uh, what do I bring? What can I bring? I spent seven years on the planning board from 95 until 2003. And, and in, during that time, I, I, along with John Kuhn, was the co-founder of the first uh, of the comprehensive plan committees, which ran five years. 
uh, as an architect uh, for retiring, 50 years of professional experience. And uh, during that time, I went before many, many planning boards, uh, uh, actually never uh, this one because I had uh, recused myself after um, having served on it. Um, but uh, planning boards and zoning boards around Massachusetts and elsewhere around uh, the Northeast. Um, I was a pioneer in the design of net zero energy buildings, both residential and commercial, as a matter of fact, and, the, and was a national leader in creating living buildings. Um, I led the design team for the Bechtel Environmental Center for Smith College, which was the fifth of the uh, uh, ever achieving uh, living buildings. Um, and um, I was a consultant on the other two that were completed subsequently here in Amherst. So a lot of experience, particularly around uh, matters which have become uh, at long last uh, important to the town and, and to society at large, which has to do with uh, environmental consciousness, uh, stewardship, uh, green, high performance building, and so forth. So I have a great deal of experience in that field and, and I think it's uh, um, timely. Um, uh, my, perhaps particularly when I was on the planning board uh, before last time, I, um, I spent pretty much all of that time as the kind of motion creator. And I've, I've done that too with the, uh, the uh, uh, local historic district commission that I served with Jennifer and with Karen actually for quite a long time. And generally speaking, I find that uh, role as a useful and constructive one. And I've performed it on the planning board for seven years when Bill O'Neill was the chair, just listening to the arguments uh, listing the points, uh, diagnosing or understanding or trying to the conditional possibilities and then framing the motions accordingly and uh, always accepting friendly amendments as, a, as, a, as, a, as the board uh, discussed the motion and so forth. Um, I think I'm good at managing discussions. I think I understand the importance of uh, ordering questions and taking questions of clarification before those ones of procedural substance or comments and so forth. So I think I understand how to work with groups and uh, these kind of groups. I've done it before and I haven't lost the ability, I don't think, and I would prepare to do it again. I think I bring that to the table at least. Thank you for that. Um, that little ding was your, your three minutes. So um, thank you, Bruce and Karen. First of all, I want to say I'm a great fan of Bruce's and the reason, uh, one reason that I've even decided that it would be a good, per, a good thing to work in town government is because I've been so impressed with uh, people like Bruce on the local historic commission. His expertise certainly led uh, us, the, the three people that were completely new on the commission. I am not an expert architect or civil engineer. I greatly respect expert advice, but you can only be an expert of one, one particular thing. And the planning board has to deal with many, many different uh, aspects. And if you're not an expert, you better be a good, a really good listener who does their homework and a good judge of whose advice to follow. And um, this is what I strive for. Um, my background is in teaching. I've been a teacher at the university level when I began at the University of Stuttgart. And then in Amherst, I taught children from grades one to 12, which I greatly enjoyed. That also helps you to become a good listener and to really uh, be able to assess the needs of someone else so that you can work collaboratively or, or just achieve what you want to do uh, as a pedagogue. One thing that I think I bring that's maybe helpful is that I have um, lived in so many countries and so many communities. I have a, a relative, a close cousin who developed a significant um, piece of land in former East Germany. And I was there at the beginning. He's, he's actually a retired teacher 
of literature uh, when he went into this and his dream was to create a city block which would be for the purposes of art and education. He, unlike me, also had significant means so that he was able to do this, but relied on expert. And I watched him from the stage where this was a dream by the former uh, piano factory, the Bechstein piano factory in East Germany and turn it into a center which now houses the only gypsy, which is now called Roma Museum in the world, a discotheque, a kindergarten, which serves mostly the Turkish community that live in this area, a warehouse for architectural supplies, a publishing house, a discotheque, uh, many little artistic boutiques. It's just, a, it just turned a very, very decrepit, uh, poor, impoverished area, which was totally neglected, of course, in East Germany into a completely vibrant community. I'm, please, I can't please, say please, that I on. did any of this, but I watched it from the beginning and I think it opened my eyes to possibilities. Thank you, Karn. Shalini? All right, um, so the question is, tell us about an experience you've had collaborating with a group particularly where opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. And we'll start with Karen. Can you tell me how you pronounce your name? Karen, Karen, K-A-R-I-N. So I say Karen. Yeah. Karen. But I answer Karen. to anything, Karen. No, 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 but it's good to know. Karen, Thank Karen. You. Okay. Yeah, Thank so my experience was on the local historical um, commission and I was a complete newcomer to town government I, I, or commissions, I didn't even know what, a, what an open meeting law was and how to respect that. And uh, our very first, I think our first meeting dealt with an applicant Amherst Media. And I, I assume that you're familiar with how contentious this uh, applicant's um, quest to build on such a historically and important, and in my opinion, most beautiful open piece of land that we have left in the center of town. Um, there was a lot of history that had gone before I had become involved that, and it was clear that, that I was completely sort of over my head. So we had to rely on, thank heavens, the wonderful people on the commission that had been a part of it. Morian Adams was wonderful. Bruce was wonderful. We had an amazing staff person who guided us. And, um, but nevertheless, it took a lot of courage to ask questions because I knew how naive and, and uh, ignorant I would come across. But nevertheless, it was important to get as much information and to make comments and to make suggestions, even though the public was watching. And we had an audience which were so passionate. We had lawyers that were representing the abutters. We had people that were so in favor of Amherst Media. And I think that together as a group, we, we kept uh, asking for more and more revisions until we finally got to a point where we all felt comfortable about giving our approval. Uh, approval. And I think this experience was actually very formative for me. It was actually positive and I had nothing but awe and respect for the people that I got to know that were that were serving. So that's my first experience in town government here. Thank you. And uh, Bruce? Um, well, uh, as Pat well knows, uh, I've uh, in the past 30 years have uh, been deeply involved, certainly from 35 to 30 years ago in the development and then management of co-housing communities. Um, the Pine Street co-housing that I initiated uh, along with others, but it was, as I characterized it, my idea, which turned into our project. Um, and uh, uh, I still live there. Um, we were always striving to achieve consensus and uh, 
many of our decisions were straightforward or were harmoniously achieved, but of course, not all of them. And managing a process where you actually have to handle hundreds of thousands and uh, what would nowadays be equivalent to millions of dollars of, of people's funds, um, people were very focused and, uh, and the issues were, were meaningful and we had to negotiate that. And I was the, uh, the, the, the development leader of that group. Uh, similarly, I was for five years the chair of the Northeast Sustainable Energy uh, Board of Directors uh, during a particularly stressful period of its existence, a, a period that it threatened its demise actually. And so I was charged with trying to rescue the organization at a governance level and the organization is now thriving uh, and uh, myself and others at the time were very therefore successful I think. I've been president of the North Amherst Community Farm for the past eight years and have led uh, two successful fundraising efforts there as well as uh, the various uh, renovation restoration efforts that we've done. And all of this has given me an abundant experience, I think, of participating and managing collaborative and group design making, uh, group decision making processes. But the particular decision that uh, instance that you asked for, for me, uh, is the same as the one that Karen mentioned, because it's uh, recent and it's immediate for the town. It's the, um, the, the, the challenge that the local historic district commission uh, faced when it was uh, trying to adjudicate the application of the Amos Media Group uh, amid a, a storm of uh, public uh, engagement uh, around that. And uh, I think uh, uh, we came to a satisfactory conclusion and it was not the preferred outcome from my standpoint. I had a rather unconventional idea of how to achieve what I thought would have been a, a better and uh, more successful result. But I couldn't convince um, any of the parties involved, including my fellow commissioners, uh, of the wisdom of what I had in mind. Um, um, and I can understand why it was fairly radical, but th that it seemed to be worth pursuing. And, uh, and we, we did, um, but uh, I let it go and we worked uh, to make the best of plan B. And uh, that's... Uh, and I, right now I'm involved in the elementary school issue and right this week, right tomorrow, I think we'll see uh, issues of controversial. I'm not on the committee, but I'm actively involved in supporting those that are and particularly the chairperson, Kathy Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pat, you're next. No, wait, no, sorry. Jennifer. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Um, so my question is, um, if you, and I'm, yes, so um, Bruce, I have Bruce is the first, did you ask? Yes, yeah, I think Bruce so. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right, okay. Um, if you could please describe um, how the planning board can help achieve the goals of the master plan. Um, uh, well, I, I was involved in the master plan, not the one that was eventually adopted, but the forerunner. Um, um, but I think with uh, careful re review and support, uh, the, the constructive contributions from interested parties, um, you can get positive outcomes. Uh, the, the new elementary school, and particularly the, uh, from the town's point of view, the fate of the non-selected candidate in, in, uh, uh, in building, I think the planning board uh, as well as the town should be active in that. The, 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 the school building committee will see, I think that it's beyond their purview to, uh, even though the, 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 the challenge is created by their decision. Um, I was disappointed with the, uh, that, the public, that the North Amherst uh, development uh, on the PRP site in North Amherst didn't proceed because I thought the planning board um, could have uh, been quite active in, uh, in fulfilling some of the goals of the master plan on that side. I thought it was a challenging uh, uh, problem, a challenging application, but the, 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 the fundament, one of the fundamental challenges in town is just the revenue and so forth. These sites are important and developing them is important and trying to find the right uh, applicant and have the right applicant do the right thing. Uh, all of that is a role for the planning board in figuring out how to 
condition approvals in the most constructive way within the, uh, the constraints and the aspirations expressed by the master plan. Um, I think when you've got significant projects before the board, um, routinely probing the applicant's intentions as a board, uh, particularly so far as environmental energy performance and, and of the proposed buildings and site designs are concerned, but other issues as well, um, the planning board can set a tone that leads the town, even sometimes when the issue is not exactly in the purview of the board, where the board is not able to require something it's possible, I know from past experience, to lead an applicant in the direction, in a more positive direction, not by saying that you won't uh, approve uh, because we may not have the power to disprove, or if we do, we will end up in court and cost the town some money. So trying to um, induce applicants to do the right thing is another important role that the planning board, if it's sufficiently skilled, and coherent can do. Um, I would like the planning board uh, in the view of the master plan to try and develop the open space community development part. Uh, I think we should have more of them. I hope that the board can think of ways in which that could be achieved. That was time. Okay. So yeah. Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> So should I call in Karin or will you? Yes. Yeah, oh, okay, thank you. I was waiting for the chair. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, so Karin, um, should I repeat the question? Uh, no. Have it, which, yeah, was how do you feel okay. the planning board can help achieve the goals of the master plan? Right, right. Well, I think uh, I just reread the master plan. It's kind of a very, um, yeah, it wants it all. Uh, it wants a walkable, vibrant, diverse, you know, strong, economically secure downtown, and yet it just wants it all. And I, I was impressed because it's clear that there was the input of very many people who who weighed in, and there was a lot of thought about it. Question is how to implement it and do it in a way that's also that we don't go broke as a town. I think our finances are um, have to be healthy, and um, and yet we have to be really be ready to uh, to look at the world that we live in, sustainability and all these things. So many of the details that Bruce uh, was talking about are to me completely new. I don't know these specifics. I haven't been involved, but um, I agree that I working with the people that are proposing something in order for them to see, to, to maybe change their thinking or ch change their proposal in a way that would be more positive, I think is, a, um, is something that the board should be skilled at doing. We just saw this with um, the local historic commission working with a developer uh, who really, I think was very open to changing his plans because of input from us. And, and it was in an outside of a meeting, it was just an informal meeting talking to somebody. So I think the planning board, uh, they're, you know, they, they have a big responsibility. Amherst is, is a place in the world which is very unique. It's not just a little New England University town. It's the home of Emily, the former home of Emily Dickinson. And that really puts us on the world map. And so I think we have not only the responsibility, but also the opportunity. Maybe people should weigh in that have, that come from somewhere else, from outside. Maybe there should be things like international competitions for certain problems. I think that we could involve this might seem idealistic, but why not? Um, so my feeling is that uh, who's on the planning board, the way they communicate with each other, the way that they communicate with the public, the kind of enthusiasm that they can create for involving or getting the whole town motivated and excited about uh, implementing some new ideas is very important. Thank you. 
Um, Pat is next. Hi, right, I'm gonna start with you, Karen. Uh, would you please describe the considerations and objectives you'll use for considering proposed revisions to the zoning bylaws? Uh, yes, I, I actually looked at this question three and or three and four, it seemed to go, no, four and five seem to go a little bit together. Um, I do think that rules and regulations are very important and have a purpose. I think that uh, they bring structure and a kind of uh, just security to governing. And if you were going to reinvent the wheel every time somebody uh, wanted to change a regulation, you would get much more chaos and you get a lot more strife because everybody had to weigh in on everything. So I do think that uh, regulations need to be respected. And if you're going to make an exception, you better weigh this carefully. I also know that no rule or regulation is perfect. Is perfect. They all have, they can't be. And so what you need to do is see what is the spirit behind this regulation, the rule, why was it put in place? And perhaps the applicant has a way of dressing the spirit of this regulation in a way that's better or more suitable for a certain unique uh, situation. And I think that has to be weighed uh, carefully. And I would be very open if in a case like that, that I felt that the, the greater good would come out of making a special permit, I would be more than, than ready to, um, to approve that. So that's my feeling about rules and regulations and special permits. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? Um, well, I think it would be important uh, to use the goals, objectives, strategy statements, et cetera, set out in the master plan. I mean, this is a very thorough document. It's, uh, we've invested many more years than most towns in creating this and, and it reads well. And we should dignify all of that effort. The planning board should dignify all of that effort as other town boards and committees uh, 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 and commissions should uh, as well. So I think the master plan has to be a, uh, a guiding document for considering uh, proposed revisions to the zoning bylaw. Um, but beyond the structure of the master plan and so forth, I have a view that bylaws should provide avenues for appeal. Um, as Karen just said, you know, they're kind of blunt instruments. They're not perfect. Uh, they, we, we create them as best we can, trying to imagine the future. The future isn't ever as we imagine it. Um, so uh, structuring uh, avenues for appeal is essentially feedback. It's a way of identifying anomalies and then being able to address them with future modifications. And so I, I see appeals, uh, structuring appeals as a constructive thing to do, not just as a, a way of allowing a, an aggrieved party to uh, take their case to court. That may be as well, of course, but uh, to the extent possible, seeing appeals, and even if we don't already have them properly, structuring them so that the, we have a learning process. And, and uh, I'm not sure that, that that is fully engaged or that we couldn't do better, um, but that's, a, a, that's a, a personal consideration that I would... Uh, um, and then um, I'm not sure that I would advocate for this, but it, I think it's worthy of consideration, or it may be, and that is considering the discretionary power of the planning board. Um, should we expand it? To some degree, the argument is that we can do better if we allow the deliberative body, particularly one like ours in Amherst, which is so well supported by town staff and, and experienced town staff, I think it's safer to allow for the deliberative body to have more discretionary power. That's a, another way of sharpening the otherwise blunt instrument. But of course, the great problem with that is that it can be seen to be abused and particularly by those who may not uh, be in receipt of the decision from the board that they wanted, whichever side of a particular issue it is. 
So it's difficult, but I don't think we should shy away from it because again, I think it can deepen the uh, effectiveness and the intelligence of the, uh, of the decisions of the planning uh, and the guidance that the planning board can give. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Um, this first question goes to Bruce in, in order, and that is question five. What's your opinion of waivers, exceptions, dimensional special permits in the zoning bylaw? When should they be used and when should they not be used? And that's me? That's Bruce, yep. Yes. Well, generally, I'm in favor of waivers, and as Karen said, these, uh, this is a, there's, a, there's a sequential connection between this and the previous question, or it can be, and in my case, that's true here, because uh, waivers is another way of looking at uh, discretionary power. It's, uh, it's, it says that uh, under certain conditions, uh, we should um, allow something that may, generally speaking, not be allowed, even though they, we, we imagine that the, 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 the zoning board regulation allows for waivers, it's another deliberate, it's another discretionary power. So, as I said, when the bylaws are adjudicated by a well-supported deliberative body, as is in the case with us, uh, I think it's, um, more risky with small jurisdictions like the surrounding hill towns where boards are not so well supported by permanent staff, but that's not who we are. As I said, bylaws are essentially blunt instruments and it's virtually impossible to foresee all the future situations of any law. Uh, drafts people, you know, we who create these things uh, do their best uh, and on a basis of past experience, but the passage of time yields all sorts of innovations which tests and dulls all legal draftsmanship. So including these kind of discretionary powers like waivers and so forth, potentially sharpens these blunt uh, regulatory instruments. Um, parking, I know, is a, uh, an example where the board does have uh, um, waiver, uh, can waive parking requirements. And in my time on the planning board, and that's quite a long time ago, of course, now, uh, we use this waiver generally as a positive and useful instrument. Often we decided to waive some parking requirements, but we required that the space be retained so that the additional parking could be provided if the future need arose. But the idea of paving uh, uh, acreage uh, because the regulation says we must when we don't really have to, providing we keep the possibility, just seems to be a very good example of why and when uh, a waiver is a useful thing. But finally, um, waivers are like variances in that they create precedents that potentially open doors with unforeseen and deleterious consequences. So um, waivers, when, when considered, should be mindful of their becoming, uh, uh, or actually hoping them, trying to avoid their becoming spontaneous redrafting of a bylaw. That's not a good construction uh, of a use of a waiver. Thank you. Karen, do you want to weigh in on that? Your so um, I, I don't want to waste your time. I, I agree with everything that Bruce has said, and he has said it far more eloquently <laughs> than I ever could. So we can just continue, I think. Thank you. Okay. That goes to Jennifer now. Yeah, thank you. So I will um, be, Karen, you get <laughs> to uh, take the first uh, stab at the response to this question. And it is, what is your approach to incorporating public input um, into your decision-making? So I would not only welcome incorporating it, I think I would solicit public input into my decision making. That's just kind of who I am. And I remember um, listening to a talk once by a CEO who said decision makers uh, have to be able to make decisions, even though they know that they can only see the tip of the iceberg. You're, that's the knowledge that you have. There's going to be far more under invisible than what you can see and you still have to make a decision. As far as I'm concerned, the public uh, input just helps make more of the unknown visible. 
I've in watching these meetings on Zoom and listening to public input, and also in my experience on commissions, I I, I always learn something that I didn't know. I think it's extremely helpful, even if it's contentious and passionate and you know, uh, inflammatory, it's nevertheless, I think is valuable. So Amherst, I think uh, is a special place. You're gonna have more public input here than in a lot of places. I think that's actually wonderful. And uh, yeah, so my intake is yes, positive. Thank you, Karin. Um, Bruce. Well, like Karen, I'm uh, a fan of public input. I, I, I may be uh, I mean, in my previous time on the planning board, I guess I could um, uh, imagine a few particular instances where I thought public input was not constructive, and and and. But those are exceptions in my experience. Um, the high point, uh, probably for uh, for me, would be the first meeting that we had as the local historic district commission on the uh, Amos Media project. That first meeting, which uh, they brought a, a barn building, I mean, it was nothing like the building that they actually went, but that first building, uh, that first meeting was, there must have been 50 people from the public there. Um, I mean, we had that meeting in the town room. I've never uh, been a, a panelist, I mean, a, a, a commissioner or any, but in the town room, we were always, you know, in the boards and various other things, we were always in these little rooms, uh, I mean, uh, small little squirrely spaces and so forth, but we were in the town room, that was a big deal, and this town room was full of people, and my goodness, the, the, the level of con comment that came that day, that afternoon, we ran five, no, it wasn't that long, three hours, I suppose, everybody said what they had to say and god bless them they only said it once i think that everybody was so pleased uh, well was so con the and and so i'm sitting there doing what i do uh trying to figure out how to absorb all of this information and uh, and out of that um two and a half hours of of commentary of people saying things i think i and we diagnosed about four major things that we thought that we had to say, or that should be said to the uh, Amos Media applicant about how they might improve their application. And we, and this was entirely based, pretty much entirely based on what was said by those people in the room, just writing it down. What we did was try and synthesize this avalanche of input into four, what ended up to be four recommendations. One of them was that they employ an architect. They didn't even have a bloody <laughs> architect. So you can imagine how well received that was by me, but anyway, I'm obviously biased in that regard. But that was uh, just a spectacular example of how public input affected a process and how a board, or in this case, a commission could take that public input, constructively turn it around and, um, and, and do what we had to do, which was basically give instructions or advice and counsel to this applicant about how to move forward. Thank you to both of you. And I believe we're on to Pat. Uh, and it's Bruce again. Uh, what else would you like us to know about you that makes you a strong candidate for the planning board, Bruce? Oh, well, um, I've had experience with town staff and the planning board in the crafting and refining of two parts of the present bylaw, actually. Um, and the first was uh, when I was last on the planning board and we approved the first um, outing, I guess you could say, um, of the farmland conservation overlay. Um, uh, the properties was so-called Jones Patterson, but it was the Bukowski farm that is uh, in North Amherst here, adjacent to what is now the Simple Gifts uh, NACF, and the development that became uh, Owen, the Owen Drive development. 
But this wasn't an easy task. This was the first outing of a new uh, portion of the bylaw and, uh, and it, whoops, I, um, and, and, and it wasn't certain that we could even persuade the developer to abide by the terms of our bylaw. The concern was that they would uh, take the whole matter to the state land court and that you know, they would they go through the process and wouldn't like what we asked for, and then it would be over and we would be in court. So we worked very carefully. Uh, we managed a considerable amount of grief from the farm committee at the time, uh, largely based on what constituted uh, uh, prime farmland. That experience resulted in a better drafting of how that is done in the bylaw. Um, uh, Some time later, though, another piece of, uh, uh, let's just say that the farm, the Owen Drive development proceeded, it didn't go to land court, um, the, the, the place is still there, and the tail of the farmland has been wonderfully preserved, and is now essentially part of Simple Gears Farm, so the outcome was spectacular um, over, peri over the time period, so that was something that I'm very proud of, actually, although at the time I was uh, had all sorts of accusations of being in the pocket of Paul Jones, which was not very pleasant. Um, sometime later, uh, the two co-housing communities in town came together um, and helped to draft what became the open space community development section of the, the bylaw. And I'd introduced the idea of co-housing to the town in a number of op-ed pieces in the bulletin in the 80s. and. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, developed along with others what became Pine Street co-housing and helped and supported the other co-housing community. And by the way, we're both uh, approaching 30 years now of blissful existence. But um, the, from the time that these uh, co-housing uh, co communities were completed, we had this stream of visitors from all over the country and the town received considerable kudos for hosting these places. But the point was that it was devilishly difficult, virtually impossible to do them. The, only, the, the, the reason why these two communities exist is because of freaks of crevices in the bylaw. Our bylaw does not, did not support them at all. And the open space community development bylaw that we crafted 13 years later, we helped craft, were a big part of helping craft, and now it changes all that. Uh, Karen? Listening to Bruce, it is so obvious to me that uh, I would have a steep learning curve to be able to understand all these many facets of, of all the things that you deal with. I would say the only thing that I could say on my behalf is that I do love challenges and I work very hard and diligently to understand uh, and I, I would feel confident that working in a group such as the planning board with the caliber of people that I've seen that dedicate their time and just, just listening to you uh, would make me confident that I could uh, grow into this situation and be able to contribute. I have throughout my early years before I became a housewife and mother and part-time teacher in Amherst mostly, uh, been in various leadership positions at the University of Stuttgart. I was chosen to be the sole representative of the whole what's called Mittelbau, the, not the top department heads, but all the lecturers and assistant professors and people under that to represent us in government. I was kind of amazed to be in that position and it was tough because these professors, these top professors in Germany are monarchs and hard to bend on anything, but we accomplished a lot. And um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm looking forward to having this opportunity and thank you for considering me. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. So I, I get the last question, which is basically a yes or a no. Um, so, so we will start with Karen on, please confirm that you have the time to commit to meetings, hearings, and site visits. I do. And Bruce? Same, I do. Uh, I think both of us are in a position in life where we have the time. Uh, and, and Karen's demonstrated that with the uh, local historic district commission. She's always there when she's needed. Um, and, I, and I've been there too. 
Thank you, Bruce. Um, with that, our questions are over for the af afternoon, evening um, um, for the interviews. I want to thank both Bruce and Karen for doing the entire process, um, which because it's not just the interviews, it's it's putting your name out there, filling out a CAF, and then um, making sure you're available for the interviews, completing and writing a statement of interest, um, which are in the packets today, and then coming and attending the interviews and, and answering all of our questions and all, and, and putting yourself out there publicly for this role um, and, and stating your interest. So I want to thank you both for coming today, for taking the time um, to do the statements of interest to apply and for interviewing today. Um, after it's the same meeting, but I will uh, soon, soon I will be asking Athena to move you into the attendees section. You're welcome to continue to watch the meeting as we move into deliberations and recommendations, or you do not have to. That is your your option. Um, whatever happens today, I will be emailing you later tonight um, with um, letting you know what the decision of CRC was, whether that was we made a decision or we didn't, and if we did make a decision on a recommendation, what that recommendation is. I will be in touch with both of you tonight um, about that so that you know um, where, where we got. Um, if a recommendation is made today, there is an intent for the uh, town council to act on that recommendation on its Monday's June 6th meeting. Um, and so that is in theory, uh, if the recommendation is made tonight, it will be on the agenda. It is currently on the agenda in hopes that we make a recommendation tonight um, for action. Any action taken on June 6th would not be effective until July 1, 2022, because there are no vacancies until that date. We are seeking to fulfill um, vacancies that are coming up through the end of a term that ends June 30. So, so that would be when any um, effective dates of any appointments would be. Are there any questions that um, Bruce or Karen have before we move on to the, um, about the process and, and what's happening between now and, and say Monday at the council meeting or thereafter before we ask Athena to move you into the attendees? Not for me. I don't have a question, but I do have a short comment, uh, which is to say, I really um, applaud, appreciate, and uh, uh, the, the process that is now uh, for getting people onto the planning board. When I was uh, appointed uh, 25 years ago, it was wholly perfunctory. Someone called me up and tried to bend my arm into serving. And, uh, and then uh, I found myself on the planning board. This level of deliberation that you have is um, just so much more sophisticated and uh, uh, <laughs> and and uh, and and, com and it's just good. It's just so much better. And um, like Mandy Joe, I think you might have had something to do with that. So, thank you. I can't take all the credit. The whole council's been working hard, including our very first. Um, I'm sure. Yeah. Outreach appointments and communications. Um, team that committee that worked really hard to find something that would work and it's been refined over the last three years, but I appreciate the the comments um, and the feedback, um, because we always try to refine to make it better and better each time. So thank you for that. With that, Athena, can you please move um, Bruce and Karen into the attendees? Pat has a hand up. Is that we're going to wait till everyone oh, is appropriately okay. moved. So um, next on our agenda is a two part item. Um, and so I, I know, Pat, your hand is up. I want to explain the two parts before I, okay. I get to your question in case it answers that question. But I, I see your hand up and um, the way CRC in the past few years has found it um, helpful to have this discussion because it can be very difficult is to talk about each of the applicants and interviews first before we move on to whether any recommendation should be made and who should be made on a recommendation. So we, we try, which is why it's listed as two separate items in the action item because we try to, um, normally we have more than two applicants for two positions, we normally have more, but um, we try to make sure we've said something and, and talked about every applicant before we've moved on to what our own members, CRC members believe 
should be the recommendation. So we're going to keep with that, um, even though there are two vacancies, we are going to keep with that plan to talk about each applicant first. Before we do that though, because there are two vacancies and two applicants, um, I am going to request that we have a mini discussion on the sufficiency of the applicant pool again. Um, that does not mean that any of the interviews we just held were for naught, but um, as we've seen in the ZBA process, we can always revisit the sufficiency and make a determination there. Given the fact that there are now two applicants for two positions, I believe it would be important for us to put some sort of comment into the report I'm going to file tonight about that situation. And so I'm going to request that we talk very briefly about that situation first before we move on to um, the applicants themselves and then any recommendations. So Pat, with that plan, Pat. <laughs> with that plan in mind, I'm gonna not follow it. Um, the reason is that I need to explain my relationship with Bruce. Um, he talked about me being a friend and we're certainly friends, but it's much more, um, it has devolved over the years to an acquaintance relationship. We met 30 years ago and worked very hard together on uh, the Pine Street co-housing. Um, and then Carol and I were not able to follow through, um, but it was a wonderful process um, and created an interesting community. Uh, and over the years, I've sort of known him and Mary, but we have no, uh, we're really acquaintances. I did use Coldham Hartman to redesign uh, our energy retrofit and to, um, change some of our house, uh, redesign some of the house, but I was not involved with Bruce in that process. I worked with Andrew and I'm blanking on his last name right now. And uh, Jesse and um, Tom Hartman led that group. Um, so um, I just wanted to be clear uh, about that. I thought it was important. Thank you for that. That goes in under disclosures. <laughs> so I, I will also probably note that in, in a, um, in a report so that it, it is fully in there. Um, Pam and then Jennifer. Uh, thanks. Um, I would I would certainly love to see a number of people, you know, lining up ready to serve on the planning board. Um, having having heard from both of the candidates, I'm I'm feeling very solid about the qualities and capabilities of of the candidates so that I would not want to hold up the process in order to um, broaden the pool. Thank you, Pam. Jennifer. So I hadn't actually even thought that I might have to disclose, but um, I served on the local historic district commission with both Karin and Bruce. So, I mean, that's, so I'm just disclosing that um, there's certainly, and so having served with them, um, I would, I guess, concur with Pam that um, I think that, you know, I may be jumping ahead. I mean, I think they are both excellent candidates. So I know we would prefer to have, you know, maybe more um, applicants than spaces, but I think that in this case, you know, we would be well served with both at very, that we're lucky to have both the applicants. Thank you, Shalini. <clears throat> so it's kind of awkward, right? Um, but I'm looking at uh, the current planning board members and it's a very new board. Like most of them are 2020 and uh, there were new people who've not served in planning board before. So it's kind of like a very fresh new planning board. And Doug, I mean, sorry, one of the members is, okay, no, one, mem mm, yeah, only one member is three years old and the others are gonna be two years in this term. And it takes easily two to three years to really, two years at least to sort of, I don't know. It just feels that it's a very new board and it would have been nice to have uh, more applicants with more experience. And this is not to say at all, not you know, towards any particular, because I, I agree with everyone that it was really wonderful to hear 
uh, what each candidate brought brings to to the planning board. But I don't I yeah, this is I don't know if you've had this situation before and what what are the options here? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll take my my shot to answer that question and to say some things before we um, move into talking about each candidate um, and then a potential recommendation. Um, this particular situation has never in my, I mean, the council's only four years old, right? Three and a half years old. And um, the I, I think I've been on nearly every appointment for finance recommendation for finance and ZBA and CRC um, for the last three years because of the committees I serve on. And this situation has never happened. The closest we've gotten was with ZBA, I believe, last year, where um, I believe we had two openings plus four associates because we already have we always have four associate openings coming up vacancy wise because they're one year terms um and when the um statements of interest came in um i think we had one statement of interest come in for all of those openings if i'm remembering correctly last year but that was before we'd held interviews or before we'd sort of even scheduled them um and so I was able as chair to go back to CRC and say, are we putting a hold on the process now that the deadline for statement of interest have passed and we haven't made it sort of to that interview stage. And so we were able to put that hold on, put a hold on for a couple of weeks on the interview process, go out, recruit more and try and get more candidates so that we had a sufficient pool to at least move forward on the full member applicants for ZBA. And that's actually what we had in some sense decided was there are two sort of sets of app, sort of sets of appointments for ZBA. There are the, the members and then the associates. And we said we had at least a sufficient pool for the members, even if we decided not to appoint associates during that time. Um, so that's the closest we've ever gotten to this situation. Um, you know, it, it, it's a tough one, um, you know, options, right? The options are to move forward um, without any reservations. The, an option is to say we've now interviewed two of some number of candidates and we're going to put a pause and we're not going to make any recommendations today while we try to recruit more and then hold another set of interviews at some point. Um, while also stating that we would not require the two we just interviewed to come back for interviews, um, you know, but but try to find um, more applicants. I know it gets awkward when we've already held two interviews, right? The whole thing is just awkward. Um, not something I like to do anything about as chair, but a withdrawal came today an hour and a half before the meeting. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's there's only so much I can do as chair. Um, and then another option is to consider the two applicants right now and potentially only fill one or recommend one of two vacancies or zero. So, so we can always recommend zero, one, or two, right? Um, after discussion, or we could say at this point, you know, we don't like this pool, not because of the qualifications of the candidates, but because it's just not a sufficient pool um, under the guidelines that the council has given us and all. And so we're going to pause the process completely and not discuss any of the candidates and not rec make a recommendation. Those are sort of the options I see, um, none of which I would say necessarily are great for and various different reasons. And, and, you know, I think we can all guess what some of those reasons are. Um, but, but those are what I see as the options. Um, I mainly wanted to have this discussion because I am foreseeing someone wondering why we went forward with interviews for two, va two vacancies with two candidates um, and asking that question at a council meeting. And so I wanted to be able to address it in the report ahead of time, which requires us to have a conversation so I know what to write in the report. Um, so so that that's sort of, you know, and, and I don't know what I think at this point as to what the right choice is. Um, Jennifer and then Shalini. 
Yeah, no, I just wanted to add that I do think we have to look at Bruce, who has served on the planning board for eight years as not new in the sense if we're looking at, yeah, that he brings um, probably more experience than any candidate maybe ever. So I just want to add that. Thank you, Shalini. Yeah, my comment wasn't for Bruce, but I didn't want to single out anybody. I was just saying it as a general comment, but definitely it wasn't directed. I, I learned a lot listening to Bruce today, so, uh, and I could keep listening. But anyway, I, I think what I was going to say is that maybe we can reframe this position as saying we are very fortunate to have two very solid candidates. And could we try for more like not decide today so we already have two really good candidates and try for more i mean but it's ending june 30th so i don't think we have much time but should we try for some more candidates and then if we don't get within a certain time period that we decide we're like yes we got two very good candidates see how hopeful i was <laughs> You're muted, Pat. Never fails that I forget to do that. Um, I'm interested, it looks like, um, well, Maria Chow is leaving and Jack Jemsik are the people that are leaving, which leaves us with Doug Marshall, Johanna, Janet, and Tom. And Mandy, since you were involved in the process before, uh, can you speak to their experience? Um, because they may be new members of the planning board, but I don't know, you know, what is their experience? I know jo Johanna had the least experience in terms of uh, anything but environmental issues. Um, so I think she's had a steep learning curve. Uh, but I, I'm interested in, and Janet, um, I don't know if Janet has had architectural experience or not, but she, so I'm, I'm interested in if you can fill me in a little bit on that before, because that might affect how I decide about the two candidates. So and Andrew's still on, right? Th that's Are Andrew you? Long. Um, so yes, so I'm sorry. The, yes, Andrew. Andrew also. McDougal and Tom McDougal. Long. It's McDougal. Oh, right. Yeah, for Tom, Tom Long. Long and Andrew McDougal. So of the five in residents who members who are continuing on because their terms have not expired. Um, Janet McGowan has the longest serving time, which is four years um, as of June 30th. Um, she was appointed by the council to a first term um, of, I think it was three years, um, and then was reappointed last year right. um, to another term. Um, Johanna and Andrew and Tom were all appointed at the same time, um, which was a year after Janet. And then um, Doug Marshall was appointed last year to a one-year term. Well, two years ago, I guess, to a, he was appointed to a one-year term to fulfill an unexpired term and then was reappointed last year. That's what it was. So he has now served two. Janet is at four and everyone else is entering, I guess, their third. Um, Pat, you're muted. I think I think I've got those times, but I could be a little bit off. Yeah, on no, the times are pretty good. But what I'm yeah. saying so is, what is what was their experience? My understanding. Have, what is, is none of any of them five, an architect? Plan, you know, none of those their, five had served on any planning board or zoning board of appeals prior to appointment to our planning board. Um, Johanna is an activist and an environmental. Um, fundraiser fundraiser um so she she was brought that experience in uh, janet mcgowan is an attorney um and andrew tom andrew I, i'm andrew tom and doug all have um either architect or engineering type experience one of whom is more experienced in the real estate side than in the sort of design architecture side um and so the that's sort of the background of the current and Maria is an architect board. Um, I'm sorry, say that again, Jennifer. 
Maria Chow's an architect. Yeah, but she's yeah, not but she's continuing leaving. on. But she's leaving. Oh, okay. Yes. So if you look at this, the selection guidance, you will see some of that background in in the selection guidance written by Doug Marshall um, in terms of what what the board is losing and what it is not. Um, so that that's in brief a summary of the so continuing there, yeah. members. Pam and then Pat. Oh, no, my hands. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I was going to say Andrew McDougall um, actually got a landscape architecture degree, but does a lot of retail development kind of things. So he brings sort of real basic construction and, and um, um, sort of retail outlet space, but, but falls back on landscape architecture when he needs to. There are currently two full architects on the board, plus Andrew, the landscape architect slash developer. Um, and and um, uh, Janet McGowan with the law degree, um, also having been on the board for now three or four years, uh, read, reads plans pretty well, I understand. So um, we would, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not seeing any other hands. I'm not necessarily seeing um, any strong desire one way or the other to um, either formally go forward with the process or formally not go forward and, and sort of pause the process uh, before I continue my statement, Pam. <laughs> well, I would make a motion if that would, if that would help your solution. So so I don't think motions are necessary unless we're really divided, um, you know. So Shalini, and then and then I'll I'll go back to, or Pam. Pam, what are your thoughts at least? Yeah. All right. <laughs> My thoughts are that as awkward as it seems, I think the the idea of somehow awaiting a third or fourth miraculous expert is unlikely. I was very pleased at the considerations that both candidates uh, expressed on, on a whole range of, you know, we put a few, we put a lot of questions in front of them and I, and I feel that they addressed them well. Um, I, I am not of a mind to somehow hold up the process to fulfill um, uh, a different pool ca uh, candidacy or, or uh, just a different pool. I guess that's what I could say. Uh, Shalini, you unraised your hand before I recognize Jennifer. Do you want a chance or shall I just go to Jennifer? <laughs> I guess I could ask the question. I mean, I'm I feel it's more like what the planning board needs and do, I don't know, it's, I, I'm just feeling very, con I, I, do, I'm, yeah, I'm sort of confused what, what is the right step here and I feel like we have, okay, I guess my question was, is there, do we, I don't have the planning board's uh, recommendation or needs or it's in the me. statement of interest. It's in the okay. selection guidance, which is in the packet. Okay. You want me to write? You want me to tell you what what it kind of? Um, no, I think yeah. Shalini can pull okay. it up. I can um, just pull it out and read it quickly. Okay. So here, here's a thought. Um, Jennifer, you go, and then I'll 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 propose something. I mean, I do think in terms of what the planning board needs that these candidates bring what is ne what is needed. Um, I don't think the planning board as right now as they are as at lacking for expertise. I mean, they're all very well qualified to be on the planning board and they've been there for two, three and four years. Um, you know, Bruce, you know, clearly brings experience and expertise. I mean, for decades, I don't think you get a, a more experience that's candidate. And then I do think I've always thought this for really, well, like even on the finance committee, I've, I, I, I've always felt that it would be a really terrific addition to like almost every boarding commission to have 
you know, a, a resident member who brings commitment and experience, you know, serving and being an active volunteer in town, but who is there, you know, kind of representing just the, I don't want to say the average person, but that it's, you know, I think the planning board could almost, it's its very heavily weighted to architects, which is, you know, makes sense. But I think it's really could very helpful to have a, someone who brings, you know, just a general public representation. But, you know, again, we have a candidate who brings more than that, you know, who's lived in cities all over the world and has a very broad view of what can be. But I think, so I, I guess I see both the candidates that we have now bringing a particular perspective um, in terms of who they, you know, the community and expertise and commitment that would really fit in very well with the current board. And again, I don't think the current board is lacking for um, qualified members of the planning board. Thank you. It's clear we've moved into wanting to talk about the candidates. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna move into that. Um, my proposal was going to be that we talk about the candidates, we make recommendations, um, but that we be clear that we leave, essentially we leave the decision on the candidates and the sufficiency of the pool and as whether they want to up to the council by making a recommendation and being clear about the size of the pool and this conversation. Um, so, you know, and letting the full council, since it is the council's formal appointment, basically tell us whether or not we should have gone forward by deciding whether or not to make any appointments based on a recommendation we make. So let's, let's discuss the candidates briefly. Um, we've already heard a little bit about each candidate, um, but um, would anyone like to say anything um, about Bruce, um, that they would like to in, have included in the report beyond I, I will do a summary myself but um, but if someone really wants something specifically stated in the report um let me know pam thanks so uh i was on the board in fact bruce recruited me to go on the planning board so he and i served together and what he stated is absolutely true. He is very good at um, collecting the, the conversation, synthesizing and helping move projects forward. Um, I think the other, the other aspect that I would strongly, strongly state is that both candidates actually are very open and understanding of the role of public comment and public input. And I think that um, in a town such as ours, we should not be afraid of public comment. We should endorse it and embrace it. And I think both of these candidates, including Bruce, um, do that. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I also wanted to add, you know, Bruce's um, expertise and everything he brings in terms of, you know, his environmental expertise. We're talking about, you know, how, you know, to bring that lens and all that knowledge. And he was really way ahead of the curve. So I think, you know, given all our climate action goals, that would be terrific, you know, and he would be joining, you know, Joanna Newman in that, you know, I think the, the two together in terms of their, uh, the climate lens and expertise that would be brought to the planning board would be, um, Amherst would be, you know, very fortunate to have, to have that. Thank you. Shalini. Yeah, I would agree with what um, both Pam and Jennifer said, um, and given our, like what I heard Bruce um, talk about really was aligned with three of our very important goals, which is the climate action goals and then affordable housing or, or family housing, which, you know, he's initiated and being a leader in that, in that area. So he's um, 
has that experience in how to initiate new projects and how to make that happen with community engagement. And uh, the third, I even heard him talk about the economics and understanding how we have limited land and while we want to retain open space, there are certain areas that could be developed and how do we do that in a thoughtful way. So I really appreciated um, him saying that. And, and I think I agree that we definitely want public engagement. And, and again, I, I, it's just that we, I mean, I just want to, and this is even for the candidates and the public and everyone, like we really need to try and find ways to engage all stakeholders. So when we say public has spoken, we again are, you know, and, and it, we have very vocal uh, residents who've made a lot of really good things happen in our town. And at the same time, we're not engaging the entire town and all stakeholders. So I really hope all future candidates and all of us will continue to engage um, our neighbors and residents and also look at um, the, the groups of people who are not being represented. Maybe they will never come to council meetings because they don't have time, but we have to find ways how to get the input of different groups whose voices are not included in our decision making. Um, that's all, yeah. Thank you. Jennifer. The other, I, I wanted to add this, so I'm just, um, forgot to, as I, uh, Bruce and Karen also bring, well, the two candidates are, come from different, very different parts of Amherst. And so I think that that's, you know, also important that we have, um, you know, including one of the candidates, um, you know, lives close to the university and close to downtown. And I think that's a good perspective um, to have on the planning board, which I think has been missing for a long time. Thank you. Um, comments on Karen? That people would like included in the report. Pat. Well, she intrigued me. Um, uh, for several reasons. One is her personal experience uh, living abroad and also working with children, um, uh, which is dear to my heart. Her work on the local historical commission seems important um, and gives her a certain kind of experience with public bodies and decision making. Um, she also uh, ha had a, a sense or it seemed to me to have a sense that uh, that was echoed in Bruce's talk about public uh, comment, that it really need, needed it to um, be able to uh, look at unintended consequences. Um, and so I stand corrected <laughs> uh, by uh, Jennifer and Pam. I must uh, say that I did not want a question about public comment on the, as you know. And it's not because I'm opposed to public comment, but I just, but both people gave me clear um, examples of why, how to use it. And I think what I object to with public comment is it's not used to collaborate. It's not used to bring people together. It's in our town right now, as far as I'm concerned, it's used to divide and keep divisions uh, alive like scabs, you know, um, and, so both of them intrigued me in that way. Um, it does seem to me that Karen um, was very apologetic for herself. And I think that she doesn't need to be. Um, I think that she's bringing uh, an important perspective, which is the layperson's uh, perspective and talked about how hard she's willing to work, what she's willing to learn, uh, what she's willing to do. And I know how hard Bruce works because uh, of his own explanations about uh, working with uh, around Amherst Media, being on planning board, being appointed arbitrarily, et cetera. So I'm feeling fairly comfortable uh, because we had really 
not very many people coming forward. Um, I'm feeling comfortable with these two candidates. Thank and you. going forward with appointing them. Thank you. Pam. For recommending. Thank you, Pat. Those are yeah, good points. Um, uh, something else about Karen, I was, I was actually surprised and we didn't get a chance to ask her, but my understanding that she has served as an associate member on the, on the Zoning Board of Appeals for several years, at least one year, and there was no mention of it. Um, but my, my understanding may be wrong that there is still a fair amount of, of training and learning that goes on to interpret bylaws, to interpret regulations, to make decisions on waivers and setbacks and all of that stuff that she didn't really mention. Now, maybe, again, we didn't get to ask for that, um, but maybe she never actually participated in a project discussion. I don't know that, but I can't help but think if she has been exposed to that, that's a, that's a, actually a far better basis than most people who step onto the planning board with, with eggs, you know, zero, zero experience in actually reading and interpreting bylaws. So I thought that um, could be an oversight, but um, she's got to have absorbed something from the CBA processes for the last year. Thank you, Shani. Yeah, we do appreciate Karen's um, uh, perspectives, especially around listening and, and the courage it takes to ask questions. And I think many of us came in with no experience at all. And so again, uh, I, I also appreciate Pat's uh, comment that we don't need to be apologetic. We don't have previous experience, but what it really is about the willingness to to show up fully, to have empathy, to listen to different perspectives. And I really uh, appreciated the fact that they can be contentious or, but there's something to learn in that. And uh, Karen, Karen is willing to bring that. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's, uh, those are two very strong qualities, listening and asking questions. Thank you, Jennifer. And then I'm gonna make a comment. Um, well, I know I've um, served with Karen and I just, she is very dedicated and very hardworking and very fair. And in the time she was on the local historic district commission that she's been on, I mean, Amherst Media was, you know, that was really learning kind of trial by fire. So she, it was going over plans and plans and setbacks and it, you you know learned anyone who went through that process learned a lot about planning so it was really almost like being on the planning board for that project and then um also in the local historic district commission you know i know they karn was on and was really a leader in that discussion in a new townhouse development going there and that was you know some may think that a historic district would be resistant to that but the district wasn't and Karen was really, you know, very, um, I would say a leader in let's be open to bringing the new, you know, into this area. So I, um, you know, again, her, and it's a lot of work being on the planning board. I mean, it's hours of meetings and it's uh, like they have hundred page documents to prepare, which I think may be why there's not as many people lining up <laughs> as we might like, but, um, so I would say she, you know, she is very hardworking, very dedicated, and like I said, very fair and open to all perspectives and open to the new. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to say I agree with much of what's been said about Karen. Um, I do have concerns. Um, Pam actually mentioned some of that concerns, which is Karen has been an associate member of the ZBA for a year. Now, I don't know whether that means she's actually served on an application or not, but it's very concerning to me that it was not mentioned anywhere in the statement of interest or in her interview, even to say, while I've been this, I haven't had an opportunity to do anything with it. Um, and so I, I don't know what to take from that. Um, 
you know, I, I, I appreciate the lay experience um, and the lay opinion. Um, I worry if we put, um, if we tilt the planning board, and this goes more towards just in general planning board appointments, if we tilt the planning board more towards that over um, those um, that have training, um, in, in some sense, if we make a recommendation for both of these individuals, we will have a planning board that has four individuals trained in planning type experience and three not trained um, in that experience because um, there will be three architects. Um, I think, yeah, there will be three, four architects, one, no, three architects, one landscape architect, um, an attorney, which I, I can say my attorney training is not training in, in <laughs> planning. Um, and even though it gives me some background um, along with um, an environmentalist um, that has some background, but not in, not necessarily in architecture or engineering, we won't have any engineers, you know, we're stuck with the pool we have, right? Um, and, and we will be lacking any engineering experience, I believe. Um, and, and I worry if we tilt too far, but that doesn't mean I don't, support a recommendation to support all of these. I'm just concerned at a very young board with a very steep learning curve for one member that we might be recommending. And that that person has admitted to a very steep learning curve. Um, and, and how that will result in discussions at the planning board, I don't know. Um, but that steep learning curve, given the youngness of this current planning board um, and the experience does concern me. Um, and I, I would have been remiss if I didn't say that. Um, give, given this option, I would have really liked to have a lot more applicants. I always like to have more applicants. Um, that's not to say anything about this pool. Um, I. I I was concerned with three when we had three for two spots, um, you know, and so, um, but, but I wanted to mention those concerns um, specifically, um, even though, you know, I, I support she, very much the willingness, the desire to learn the admission of needing that steep learning curve is very important too, because if someone doesn't believe they do, that almost bodes worse than someone who knows they have that, right? You know, and so, so I and and I, I take all of um, you know Jennifer and, and Jennifer in particular because you've served with with both of them on on her dedication and her willingness to learn. Um, so I have to take that a lot into consideration as we get here. But but I wanted to at least um, voice some of my concerns. Um, with sort of where the planning board as a whole will be if these, what I believe the recommendation out of this board will be and assuming the council takes that recommendation and, and votes accordingly, I, I do have some concerns for the status of the planning board as a whole going forward with its very limited in some sense experience. Um, but I'm done for now, Pat and then Jennifer. Okay, um, I am unmuted. Um, I'm going to laugh at you a little bit, Mandy Jo, because uh, your lawyerly training has certainly uh, enabled you to uh, dive into zoning and planning issues um, very dynamically with and, and to really, in a short period of time, uh, develop a deep understanding that I respect. So I guess I disagree that uh, an attorney that who's also the longest, going to be the longest serving person, uh, leaves us in a problematic position. Um, one of the things after having gone through some uh, work, work with the planning board in the last so many months, um, I feel like what we do need is a more diverse pool of people. And what I um, respected about Karen, who I've never met before and never worked with, 
is um, her kind of being able to look at herself, I think, she, and to pinpoint things that she would need to work on. Uh, I appreciate that a lot. And, and I feel like um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more open for, for diversity um, in this instance and experience only because all of the candidates are white, which is really too bad um, to, to go along and to say that I could, uh, I certainly can support her as a, a, and recommend her to the council. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, I guess I you know, spoke to this a little earlier but I guess I'm not really seeing the planning board as being a new board because three of them, the members have been there three years. One has been there four years. So that seems like a, you know, that, that seems like what, Pam. Pam, you- I guess we could go over how many years has each person Janet's been four years. Well, if if we start with last July, which is the beginning of the next round. So Doug had served one year and was renewed starting the beginning of a three-year term. He was just an interim something. Janet had been on for three years and is renewed for another three-year term. Andrew, Johanna, and Tom all started a year ago July. So they've all had a year on the board. I see them sort of coming into their own. They're asking questions. They're interacting better. Um, and so I think, uh, and then Bruce, Bruce is going to, you know, walk in and just sit running. So uh, I think, I think his structuring of commentary will be helpful to everybody, whether they have a lot of experience or don't. Um, and I didn't mean to cut down for a while. No, no, that's fine. I'm glad you corrected me because I wrote it down and I, I did write it down incorrectly. But I do think Doug Marshall, you know, he brings, you know, he's set years of expertise in planning in Amherst. So he might have, so I, he might have just be starting a second year, but I, I would consider him a very experienced Amherst planner. So I just wanted to just share that I, my, I think, I'm not feeling uncomfortable in there not being, um, you know, in it being a, a, a novice board. I think that there's, you know, between at least Doug Marshall, Janet McGowan, and if Bruce were to join, that that would be a good number of the board that that brings years of experience. Pam, thanks. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would echo that. Um, I think I. I am very happy having no more architects. I mean, three architects on a board is way more than usual. Usually there's maybe an architect, a landscape architect, maybe an engineer. There wasn't the whole time I was on the board. Um, there's always been an attorney, which has been great. Um, so I think it's a it's a it's gonna be a pretty decent mix. I, I have no qualms about that. I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. It sounds like we might be ready for a motion. Um, so I will read a motion based on the conversation I have heard um, because then it matches the one that's in my report. <laughs> and, and it matches what Athena is gonna be putting in um, her the motion sheet, it makes it easier. Um, so it's a, a motion to recommend the town council appoint to the planning board effective July 1, 2022 for terms expiring June 30, 2025, Bruce Coldham and Karen Winter. Second. Is there further discussion?
Seeing none, um, we will go to a vote on that motion. Um, we start with Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. And Shalini. Yes. That is unanimous. With that vote, um, we have finished our action items for the evening. I was off by about five minutes. Sorry about that, Athena. There's no unanticipated items. There are no announcements other than we have a meeting next week. I'll post that agenda. Well, I'll send that agenda to Athena soon. Um, I will have that packet ready, I think tomorrow. Um, so I don't know when it'll get on the web, um, but I will be dealing with that tomorrow. Um, it will be rental registration for the whole meeting. Um, so, so we're, we're going to move one thing earlier. It'll be, um, we will be discussing about inspections too. We're adding inspections into the discussion, which was not supposed to happen for two more weeks, but we're going to do it next week. Um, so with that, um, unless there are any other hands that need to say anything, um, I'm going to pause for 10 seconds, Pam, before I adjourn, Pam. Can you just quickly, if you have them in your head, what sections of the, of the bylaw are we talking about? Give me three seconds and I'll be able to tell you because I have the agenda ready. Um, I only have seven seconds left. So that is um, the discussion of inspections and other requirements are sections H and I of the referred draft and sections seven, nine, and 10 of the current bylaw. Thank you. Is what we're adding into reviewing the language for what we discussed last week. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other hands, I'm adjourning the meeting at 6.07 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Athena, I'll have that report to you sometime later tonight. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you, Athena.